yeah, it's a pleasure to introduce Henry Cohn uh, for his final lecture this week. We're recording. Please keep your camera off if you don't want to be in the video. And feel free to unmute yourself and ask questions. I'll put a link to uh, Henry's slides in the chat. Henry, please, uh, whenever you're ready. Thanks. So what I'll be talking about today, I should say, is uh, work in physics. I'll be talking about some joint work with Nima Afkami Jetty, Tom Hartman, David Dalat, and Amir Hussain Tajdini, as well as uh, previous work uh, in this area by other people. And so in particular, we'll be talking about conformal field theory in two dimensions. And I'll try to make this as accessible as possible. I'm not an expert in this. I'm assuming that most of you aren't experts in it either. Uh, but on the other hand, there's some fascinating mathematics here. And one of the things that we'll run into is that uh, Quantum field theory is not entirely mathematically rigorous. There are certain aspects of it that are, but there are a lot of aspects that aren't. And so basically we'll try to identify particular parts that can be formulated in clean mathematical ways, despite the fact that we won't be able to do that for all of physics. So what do we mean by conformal field theories? So these are, basically quantum field theories that are invariant under all conformal transformations. So there are a lot of these, and part of what's important about them is that we expect lots of statistical mechanics models to basically degenerate to conformal field theory at certain critical points. So basically we expect critical phenomena to be scaling invariant. And scaling invariant is not quite the same thing as conformal invariance. Conformal invariance is much stronger because it's a sort of local scaling invariant, where you scale invariance, where you can rescale by different amounts at different points. So global scale invariance is weaker than conformal invariance, but in a lot of cases, conformal invariance sort of comes along for the ride. And we can think of this as basically doing quantum field theory in a scale invariant way, plus a little bit more. So why on earth is this coming up uh, in uh, the current uh, summer school? So one way of thinking about this is exceptional structures in mathematics come in a sort of hierarchy. There are certain ones that are really sort of discrete combinatorial objects. Think, you know, binary error correcting codes and certain exceptional groups like Mathieu groups that act on them. And using these combinatorial objects, you can build geometric objects like, for example, the leech lattice. Uh, and then you have more sorts of groups like Conway groups that act on these. And there's a third level of this hierarchy that using these geometric objects like lattices, you can build physics objects, conformal field theories, vertex operator algebras, which are a mathematical formulation of certain chiral CFTs. And again, you get new sorts of groups that act on these exceptional structures like the monster finite simple group. So basically the same way we progressed in the first couple of days from binary error correcting codes to Euclidean sphere packings, you can think of this as following this process one step further. And each time you get some of the same phenomena that you previously had, however, everything gets a little bit more subtle and a little bit richer. So basically, you can think of the binary case as sort of totally concrete, finite things that involve no technicalities at all. You can think of the Euclidean setting as requiring some technicalities. It takes some effort to build Euclidean harmonic analysis rigorously, but this is stuff mathematicians have understood from a, for a long time. And in terms of conformal field theory, we're still understanding it now. But on the other hand, it's still part of the same natural progression here. So in particular, what we're going to be dealing with today is a program that physicists call the conformal bootstrap. So here the idea is 
how can you figure out what the space of possible conformal field theories looks like? In particular, what do various self-consistency relationships tell you about this? And in particular, we'll be dealing with the modular bootstrap, which basically asks, what can we learn from conformal invariants of partition functions? And it will turn out this is deeply connected with linear programming bounds. So the big picture here from a physics perspective is quantum gravity. And this is wildly speculative, but really fascinating. So remember, one of the biggest problems in physics is general relativity and quantum mechanics are just not directly compatible. And we need a theorem of quantum gravity that unifies these. And one of the big ideas in modern theoretical physics is what's called the ADS-CFT correspondence. So what it says is basically certain theories of quantum gravity. So for example, quantum gravity in three dimensions should correspond to certain conformal field theories. Here, two-dimensional conformal field theories. So this doesn't hold in full generality as far as anyone knows. This is quantum gravity in what's called anti-de Sitter space. And unfortunately, that's the opposite of the sort of space of the sort of universe that we seem to live in. So you can think of this as a toy model that there seems to be a correspondence between quantum gravity theories and CFTs in a slightly different sort of universe, at the very least closely related to ours. So here the idea is we know very little about 3D quantum gravity, but we know somewhat more about two-dimensional conformal field theories. And the question then is what can we learn about quantum gravity by studying CFTs? So today I'm not going to tell you what these terms mean for the most part because they don't all have rigorous mathematical definitions. On the other hand, we'll try to black box as much of it as we can, and by phrasing things in terms of partition functions, at least get well-defined mathematical statements about partition functions, and then see what we can analyze about those. So any questions about anything so far? Okay, so the basic thing we'll be looking at today is what does conformal invariance mean? So remember, conformal equivalence basically means locally rescaling your Riemannian metric so the angles are preserved because angles are not scaling, are scaling invariant. But on the other hand, distances can get wildly distorted. So this is deeply connected with the theory of modular functions. And there's a simple reason for that. Suppose we look at two-dimensional tori. So just, you know, any two-dimensional torus with some Riemannian metric on it. So it follows from uniformization that any two-dimensional torus is always conformally equivalent to a flat torus. In other words, it's conformally equivalent to a torus that you get by modding out the complex plane by some lattice. And here, Conformal equivalence allows us to rescale the size of the lattice and, of course, to rotate it however you want. So you can always rescale and rotate so that one of your lattice basis vectors is just the complex number one, and the other one is some number tau in the upper half plane. So you can always reduce to a basis like this. And at that point, what does change of basis amount, amount to? Change of basis goes between the basis tau 1 and the basis a tau plus b, c tau plus d, where a, b, and c, d are in SL2z. And after rotation and rescaling, that amounts to doing a linear fractional transformation of tau. So in particular, this is telling us that 2D tori mod conformal equivalence is the same as the upper half plane mod the action of SL2z by modular transformations. I should say I haven't proved this, of course, but I've at least stated a true fact. So this is very nice because it's telling us that conformal invariance properties in the space of tori amount to sort of natural modular questions. This is part of why modular forms are so important.
So the setting we're going to be working with is a two-dimensional conformal field theory. And in particular, it's going to be, we're going to have a certain partition function. It's going to be a function of two variables, tau and tau bar. I should say physicists have different notation for complex conjugates. Here, tau bar is not necessarily going to be the complex conjugate of tau. Think of it as just two independent variables. So the partition function is going to be a generating function for states of the system. In particular, the natural normalization for physics purposes comes out kind of weird. But what it's going to be is it's going to be a sum over all states of the system. Keeping track of two things, we're going to have a couple of variables, q and q bar. They're going to be complex numbers in the unit disk. And we're going to have certain shifts given by what are called conformal charges. Just think of these as two parameters of the system. And then we're going to keep track of what are called the conformal weights of the state. So think of this modulo some weird shifts as basically a two variable generating function keeping track of conformal weights of every state. So in particular here, think of tau as uh, defining a parameter for a torus. And in particular, what conformal invariance is going to say is that this is going to be independent of basis for the torus. In other words, it's going to say that the uh, generating function should be invariant under modular transformations. So if we write this in terms of the usual generators of SL2Z, which uh, Danilo described in his talk, that's saying this generating function should be invariant under adding one to tau and sending tau to minus one over tau. So in particular, what does this tell us about uh, the conformal weights? So first of all, unitarity for the conformal field theory is going to tell us the weights are greater than or equal to zero. And it turns out to be natural to sort of package them in two ways. Each state you can characterize by its scaling dimension, the sum of the conformal weights. You can think of this as basically measuring how the state behaves when you rescale space. And also the spin, the difference of the two weights, which measures how it transforms under rotations. So in particular, translation invariance, if you plug it into the equations from earlier, it'll tell us that the spin always has to be an integer. However, the scaling dimension doesn't. It just can be any non-negative real number. So, so far, I know there's a lot of weird terminology here. And the motivation for why you would do this is really not clear from a pure mathematical perspective. But on the other hand, the basic scenario is simple. We've got a bunch of states. Each one is a scaling dimension and a spin. And we've built a generating function out of them. And the miraculous thing about this generating function is it should be invariant under modular transformations. And this corresponds to conformal invariance of our conformal field theory applied to tori. Questions about anything so far? So I admit that treating this as a black box is not entirely satisfactory conceptually, but at least now we've got some precise mathematical statements, namely assertions about the existence of partition functions. So there's one additional aspect here, namely Every conformal field theory is going to have what's called a conformal algebra acting on it that relates states to each other. So the simplest thing that can happen is basically the algebra is given by infinitesimal conformal transformations. That's not quite true. It'll actually be a central extension of this called the Vera Soro algebra. But morally, think of this as what's generated by infinitesimal conformal transformations, a mild extension of this. And more generally, our CFT could have extra symmetries. There could be, for example, an affine Lie algebra 
by acting on it. The simplest case is just the sum of a bunch of copies of the affine algebra corresponding to U1, or it could be some more complicated algebra. So think of this as extra symmetries, where in particular the U1 case is what the simplest thing that you could hope for. Namely, you've got a bunch of free bosons. So in particular, you're going to have two copies of this algebra acting, uh, one acting holomorphically and one anti-holomorphically. And the sort of net action of this algebra is going to group together a lot of different states. We're going to have certain states called primary fields, and we're going to have other states called descendants of these primaries that are obtained via the algebra action. And the net effect is grouping together the descendants of every primary gives a character of this algebra, specifically the character of a Verma module. So basically think of this as separating out certain primary fields that can't be obtained from other states via the conformal algebra, and then grouping together all the things that can be obtained from them to form a character. So basically what this is saying is that the partition function is going to be a sum over primary fields of characters of this algebra with some multiplicities. The character is going to depend on the spin and the scaling dimension. But on the other hand, you may get the same character multiple times if there were multiple primaries with the same spin and scaling dimension. So the vacuum is going to be the unique state with scaling dimension zero. And then a fundamental question here is what's the next smallest scaling dimension you can have? This is what's called the spectral gap, a delta one of the CFT. Delta two would be the next scaling dimension after that, et cetera. So why on earth do we care about scaling dimensions and in particular the smallest scaling dimension of a CFD? So physics motivation basically amounts to what's called pure quantum gravity. You can ask, if you want to have a theory of quantum gravity, what's the simplest thing you could have with no unnecessary states or complications? So what physicists expect is a theory of pure quantum gravity should be invariant under the Virasoro algebra. And the uh, spectral gap should grow, grow proportionally to the conformal uh, charge over 12 as C goes to infinity. In particular, think of C going to infinity as basically number of particles going to infinity. So we really care about the limit here. So in particular, what this is saying is pure quantum gravity must have quite a large spectral gap. And one thing physicists don't know is whether pure quantum gravity even makes sense. Nobody knows whether there is such a theory or, for example, whether there's some fundamental limitation on uh, conformal field theories that rules out having a spectral gap of this size. Either way would be interesting. If pure quantum gravity exists, physicists want to get their hands on it. If it doesn't exist, then physicists want to know what other sorts of modifications are, ne are necessary in order to get a handle on quantum gravity. So from this perspective, in the Vera Soro case, we can think of maximizing the, uh, maximizing the spectral gap of a CFT to basically be a necessary condition for getting pure quantum gravity. And then the question is, what can we actually rule out? So any questions about anything so far? So I know so far I've been telling you a lot of facts without actually giving you a lot of mathematical reasoning. We'll see some actual mathematical connections coming up soon. So one thing we can think of is understanding a toy version of this, where here, instead of the Virasoro algebra, we have a bigger conformal algebra, namely U1 to the C. So you can think of this as a theory of C-free bosons. In other words, uh, we've got uh, C particles with integer spin. 
So in particular, Narain gave a lattice-based construction of CFTs with conformal algebra U1 to the C, which is conjectured to give all of them. And it works as follows. So let's, for simplicity, take C bar equal to C, although there are asymmetric versions as well. So we're going to be looking at two C-dimensional lattices, and we'll write them as x comma y, where x and y are C-dimensional. So Narain looked at lattices lambda that are even unimodular lattices of signature CC. In other words, we just use the quadratic form x squared minus y squared. And so here it has to be an even lattice. In other words, every vector has an even integer length under this uh, norm. And it has to be unimodular. In other words, it's got determinant one, so it's self-dual here. So such a lattice exists for every C, and in fact, it's unique up to the action of the orthogonal group, uh, the split orthogonal group O of CC. So what Narain said is U1 to the C CFTs are going to come from even unimodular lattices of signature CC. And it's at least widely believed that this is the only way to get such a thing. So the correspondence is going to be as follows. So the lattice is going to give a CFT. Any vector in the lattice is going to give a primary here. And in particular, the scaling dimension is going to be given by one half of the Euclidean norm. And the spin is going to be given by one half of the signature CC norm. So here, the fact that it's even under this norm means the spin is always an integer. And it's not a perfect one-to-one -one correspondence. If you act by two independent orthogonal transformations in the two halves, that'll preserve the CFT. So basically, CFTs here are going to correspond to Lorraine lattices mod the action of O of C cross O of C. So in particular, what does this tell us? It tells us that maximizing the spectral gap for a Narain lattice, conjecturally maximizing the spectral gap for any CFT invariant under U1 to the C, is the same as the spear packing problem restricted to Narain lattices, which is a really interesting variant of the spear packing problem. In particular, remember that Narain lattices all have determinant one. So we fixed the number of lattice points per unit volume. And then the spectral gap is just half of the shortest norm of a lattice vector. So in particular, this is a special case of the spear packing problem where we restrict to even unimodular lattices under this split norm. So you can ask, how does this compare with the ordinary spear packing problem? And people don't really know. So in particular, we did some numerical experiments to look at C going from 1 up to 8. In other words, dimensions 2 through 16 for the packing. And what we found numerically was that the best Narain lattices we could find all had pretty nice numbers occurring in them. They're usually not quite the same as the best lattice packings without the Narain condition. On the other hand, they're still pretty close. And in some cases, like four dimensions, they're actually equal. Their E8 is actually a Narain lattice if you set things up right. Same thing with Coxeter Todd in 12 dimensions and Barnes Wall in 16. And we know as C goes to infinity that in fact, Narain lattices do almost as well as the best known sphere packings. We don't actually know how they compare though. So one possibility is that there is some gap that Narain lattices are fundamentally worse than sphere packings. Another possibility is they might actually be practically as good. We just don't know. OK. So there was a really remarkable discovery last year by Tom Hartman, Dalamil Mazach, and Leonardo Rostelli. What they found is the modular bootstrap for CFTs is practically the same thing as linear programming bounds. 
So remember, what this amounts to doing is trying to produce bounds on spectral gaps of CFTs using conformal invariants of the partition function. And it turns out this is extremely closely related with LP bounds. So in particular, in the unitary U1 to the C case, what's called the spinless modular bootstrap, I'll tell you more precisely what it is in a minute, is exactly the same as the sphere packing LP bound in R2C. And the spinning modular bootstrap, a sort of mild generalization of this, corresponds to a new bound for Narain lattices. I should say the Verasoro version is are slightly different. So this depends on your conformal algebra. In the U1 to the C case, it lines up perfectly with Euclidean sphere packing. In the Verasoro case, it's a slight variant, but another very interesting uh, linear programming bound for a slightly different structure. I'll focus on U1 to the C here because I figure there are enough weird things I'm telling you without telling you even more weird formulas. But you can look it up in this paper by Hartman, Mazach, and Rostelli. So the key question here is what are the characters of the conformal algebra? So here U1 to the C works out very nicely. The characters are basically Q to the conformal weight divided by the Dedekind data function to the conformal charge. This is the same modular uh, form that occurred in Danilo's course. So when we take into account the holomorphic and anti-holomorphic pieces, we get a sum like this. So in the spinless modular bootstrap, we want to specialize in such a way that we don't care about spin. In other words, we want to ignore the distinction between Q and Q bar and just focus on the sum H plus H bar. So we're going to specialize by setting tau bar to be minus tau. And that amounts to setting Q equal to Q bar. So notice that this specialization preserves the tau goes to minus one over tau invariance because it commutes with this specialization, but it does not preserve the tau goes to tau plus one invariance because here the minus sign makes it go in the opposite direction. So the net effect is when we specialize in this way to get rid of spin, then we get a sort of reduced partition function. Let's call it curly Z of tau which uh, amounts to a sum over all primaries of Q to the scaling dimension divided by eta of tau to the C plus C bar. Where here it still has the invariance property that it's invariant under tau goes to minus one over tau. However, we know how eta transforms. Remember eta's got weight one half. So, in particular, we can remove the eta factor here. And what it tells us is conformal invariance implies that if we count, let's say n sub delta is the multiplicity of states with scaling dimension delta. And if we set d to be c plus c bar, then what it tells us is the sum over all delta of n sub delta e to the 2 pi i tau delta is equal to the same thing with tau replaced by minus one over tau, except for an i over tau to the d over two factor, whenever tau has positive imaginary part. So basically, this amounts to conformal invariance of the partition function after we specialize our variables to eliminate the spin and after we take into account of how the denominator of the character, the a does transform. So any questions about anything so far? Okay, so this is actually a really beautiful formula. This is practically Poisson summation. So here's the great realization that Hartman, Mazach, and Rostelli had. If you take a formula like this, what we can do is imagine a complex Gaussian on RD. 
So we imagine mapping x to e to the 2 pi i tau times x squared over 2, length of x squared over 2. So I claim the Fourier transform of a Gaussian like this on Rd is equal to the same thing where you replace tau by minus 1 over tau and you add an i over tau to the d over 2 factor. And what that says is if you set the scaling dimension equal to the length of x over 2, that makes this look a lot like Poisson summation. In other words, what this function, what this formula is saying is for every radial Schwartz function on Rd, the sum of n sub delta f of square root of 2 delta, here the square root of 2 delta amounts to this transformation. But it's saying the sum of f of square root of 2 delta with appropriate multiplicities is the same thing as what you get for f hat. So the previous version of the formula was exactly saying this for all complex Gaussians in d dimensions. However, it turns out complex Gaussians span a dense subspace of radial Schwartz functions. So in fact, Poisson, for, so in fact conformal invariance of the partition function is saying that we get a Poisson summation-like formula telling us that summing a function over suitably normalized uh, scaling dimensions of states is the same thing as summing its Fourier transform. So in other words, every U1 of C conformal field theory gives us a version of Poisson summation. However, we saw last time that you can prove the linear programming bound using only Poisson summation. The linear programming bound amounts to what you get if you plug a suitably chosen test function into Poisson summation. In fact, this is a special case. This is the minus one eigenfunction uncertainty principle because this is not just Poisson summation. It's Poisson summation symmetric between f and f hat equivalently for the analog of a self-dual lattice. So in fact, this is even a special case of linear programming bounds, but it's conjectured to be equivalent to the general case. So what this tells us is the bound we get from conformal invariance of the partition function in the spinless case for the conformal algebra U1 to the C is exactly the same as the LP bound in Euclidean space. And I think this is a really remarkable fact that this question that seemingly has nothing to do with conformal field theory turns out to be exactly the same thing physicists were studying in the conformal bootstrap program. So incidentally, this is not how physicists originally derived it. There's a totally different way of deriving the modular bootstrap, but it gives exactly the same bound. So I think this is a really uh, remarkable property. And in particular, it means that what physicists really care about is they care about sphere packing bounds in very high dimensions. In particular, they care about systems with the number of particles going to infinity, which amounts to conformal charge going to infinity, which amounts to infinite dimensional limit for sphere packing. And I should say, physicists primarily don't care specifically about the U1 to the C case. That's a very special case of free bosons from the physics perspective. What they really care about is the Virasoro algebra. And that gives a slightly different uh, optimization problem. But on the other hand, you can read about it in the uh, reading list I'll give at the end of this. So from this perspective, what physicists really care about is what sort of asymptotics do you get for high central charge in the Virasoro case? So here in our hierarchy, you can think of this as binary error correcting uh, codes are the base case of the hierarchy. Euclidean sphere packing is the intermediate case, which happens to be the same here as conformal field theories with U1 to the C conformal algebra. And then the Virasoro algebra case is the top of the hierarchy, at least as we understand it so far. So here the real question is, what sort of asymptotics do you get? 
So here in this plot, we show the sort of limit that we really care about in red, the best numerical estimates we've got in green, and the best bound anybody's derived theoretically in blue. And so in particular, what physicists really want to know is whether you can get a gap uh, that's as big as C over 12 in the Virasoro case, which is what we expect pure gravity would have. In the U1 to the C case, the relevant question is C over 2 pi E, and this can in fact be achieved. It's the analog of the minkowski hlavka bound for Narain lattices. And conversely, the spinless bound in this case, we conjecture it's equal to C over pi squared asymptotically. And in both cases, the spinless bound seems to be substantially separated from the asymptotics that we really care about. And then a natural question is, what sort of stronger bound can you get? So for example, could some sort of SDP bound help close this gap? Nobody knows. So incidentally, the spinning modular bootstrap is a very natural generalization of this that takes into account spin. So for example, what it amounts to for Narain lattices is, suppose we want to prove some bound that delta one is less than, let's call it delta gap. So what we could try to do is to find a Schwartz function of two sets of variables with the property that f hat is minus f, that f is positive at the origin, and that f is greater than or equal to zero whenever your scaling dimension is large enough and whenever your spin is an integer. So here, the key difference between this and the usual LP bounds is we're only imposing inequalities for integer spin. So I've repeated the formulation up here. And once you've got this, the proof is very simple. If you had an Arrain lattice whose spectral gap was greater than delta gap, you would simply plug it into Poisson summation and say, oh, because f hat is minus f, both sides must be zero. However, the inequalities on f then give a contradiction if your spectral gap is too large. The only way you can sum to zero is if your spectral gap is small enough to get a vector in the range where f is negative. So this gives a natural generalization of linear programming bounds that take into account the integrality of the spin. And so you can ask, how good is this? It turns out we showed that it gives a sharp bound for c equals one. And it certainly gives a sharp bound for c equals four because Vyazovska showed the spinless bound is sharp there. And this is at least as good as the spinless bound. What we can't prove or disprove is a conjecture about c equals two. Numerically, it really seems to give a sharp bound for c equals two, proving a bound of delta one equals two thirds. This amounts to something called the SU31 uh, West Zemino Witten model. Basically, from a lattice perspective, it amounts to a tensor product of two A2 lattices. And it turns out this case seems startlingly similar when you play around with it to the R2 uh, LP bound. Remember, that's also unsolved. So one way of looking at this is this suggests the existence of another magic function previously unknown. Previously, there was sort of one magic function still on a humanities list defined, namely the two-dimensional LP bound, and well, extensions of that to deal with energy minimization of different sorts. But what this suggests is there should also be a C equals two Narain lattice version of this. And I don't know what else is out there, but what it suggests is that maybe the two-dimensional case fits into some broader picture, and maybe this would give some conceptual insight into how to find these functions. I don't know how to do it, but it at least suggests they're not isolated somehow. So there were a lot of questions here to be resolved. I think there were a lot of directions for further work. So for example, I just mentioned C equals two spinning bound, where there seems to be a new magic function that needs to be pinned down. 
There are questions about what happens in the U1 of C case as C goes to infinity. Does the spinning bound offer any asymptotic improvement over the spinless bound? You can ask about Virasaro asymptotics. This is what physicists care the most about, I think. You can ask questions like this for other affine Lie algebras. Physicists, to be honest, don't seem that excited about sort of arbitrarily imposing additional symmetry and asking what happens. But from a mathematical perspective, I think it's a very interesting question. And then maybe the most mysterious thing of all here is what sort of higher order bounds can you give that might go beyond what physicists are currently able to do with the conformal bootstrap? So I think there are a lot of rich questions here for exploration. And part of what's fun about it is it's an area with lots of wide open questions where we really don't know what to expect. And I think there'll be a lot of fun things to explore. So meanwhile, I think the most fundamental thing to look at is this paper by Hartman, Mazach, and Rostelli, Sphere Packing and Quantum Gravity, where they discovered this remarkable con these remarkable connections. And then I've also listed a couple of follow-up papers that uh, co-authors and I have written that explore things numerically and theoretically. But anyway, uh, we're about out of time, but let's finish up here and take questions.